computer modeling and social policy making and how the two interact. Uh, I really would consider this a course in how the computer can be used as a tool for thinking about complex systems and particularly complex social and environmental systems. And as you will discover as the course goes on, there are many ways that the computer can be used. Uh, a lot of different techniques or schools of computer modeling. And you will receive a brief introduction to quite a number of these different techniques. Uh, your, the purpose is not for you to learn in this course how to make a model according to each of the modeling schools. There are, are advanced courses here at Dartmouth where you can learn these things. Our purpose is rather to survey the whole field and what it can do and what it can't do. Uh, the course will be taught by five different professors and each of us uses a specific kind of computer modeling in our research uh, or in our policy interest. And each of us will be talking to you about the kind of modeling that we do best. The important thing for you to concentrate on is not the mathematics, the computer procedures. You will use the computer. You will run at least one example of each kind of model on the computer. Uh, and you will find it very easy to get ensnarled in all of the uh, details of making a computer work and of understanding the mathematics of each program. And it is important that you do those things. But it's more important that you also be able, after you've gone through each program, to get up a, a level and look at what you've done almost philosophically. That is, what that procedure was what you learned from it, what kinds of assumptions and simplifications you had to make. And especially at the end of the course, we will try to, to look back over all the techniques and compare and contrast each of them and ask what is each one good for, what is it not good for, uh, what kinds of statements about the world has each of these models, modeling techniques made, and where, where can that be useful and where can it be useful. Uh, so let me warn you from the beginning, that's the thing to focus on. Uh, you, you will also learn along the way some computer languages and quite a lot of mathematics. And that's uh, necessary for our task, but it's not the central part of the task. Now, I should uh, already start with definitions of some words that I've used uh, and will continue to use throughout the course. In this course, a model is going to be any set of assumptions about a complex system. That doesn't necessarily mean a set of computer equations, although we will be talking a lot about computer models. Uh, any set of assumptions at all, any simplified abstractions or generalizations about a complex system, we will call a model. And that means the mental models that you have in your head as well. Uh, each of you can get around the town you live in quite effectively. You have in your head a mental model of that town. You haven't got every single thing about the town. You have a model, a mental model. Uh, you have a model of what the world will be like 10 years from now, and that helps you to choose a career and choose courses at Dartmouth and things of that sort. And of course, it isn't a perfect model. It's simple compared to what the real world will be. But it's what you use to guide your decisions. Uh, a lot of you have a mental model of how a car, car motor works. Some of you probably have a much more detailed one than I have. Uh, and that helps you to, to drive a car or to fix a car. We're going to be talking a lot about formal, written, mathematical models. But the essence of these models is really the same as those mental models that you have in your mind. And the purpose is the same. The purpose is to make decisions about the world when you haven't got perfect information about every bit of the world. And we're going to be, in fact, going back and forth quite a lot between mental and formal models, formal models and mental models, trying to decide on the, uh, the resemblances uh, between them and how perhaps the formal models, the, the computer models, can enhance your mental models and help you to make better decisions. Now, I said a model was a set of simplified assumptions about a complex system, but I didn't say what a system was. A system 
uh, will be any set of interconnected elements. Now, that's a, a really wide open definition. Uh, according to that definition, a baseball team is a system. Uh, this class is a system. The United States economy is a system. Uh, the, that car motor is a system. There are systems all over, and they get defined according to a purpose that you have in wanting to understand something. Now, that is an extremely rough definition. At the end of the term, we will go into a lot more uh, examination of what a system is. And the readings that I've handed out for today will, will introduce you a little more to that concept. These are readings in beginning systems theory. Again, it's a subject we will begin to touch on now and uh, continue to discuss throughout the whole course. And so please read these uh, two short essays on systems theory before next time. The best way for you really to understand what a system is and what a model is is for me to give you an example, and that's what I'm going to do for the rest of the lecture today. Uh, the example will be from the first systems method that we're going to discuss in the course, which is called system dynamics. So this will be a system dynamics model. Uh, it will be an extremely simplified model. That is, I'm not going to show you today a model that's actually used in public policy. In, in fact, all the way through the course, we'll start with a really simple model of each type of uh, modeling school, and then we will, at the end, talk about some more complex models that are really used in the policy process. But we start with a model that's easy to understand and in particular possible for me to talk about in the course of one hour so that you can see it all the way through. Uh, this is a model that you will be running on the computer by the end of the week. You won't understand everything I have to say about it today. What I'm going to try to do today is go all the way through the model, tell you how it was made, what's in it, what it does, uh, and completely through the, the entire process of making a model. And the intent is not for you to understand every bit of that model today. In particular, you won't understand the mathematical equations. And I will come back on Wednesday and on Friday to go through the model once more very slowly and in detail, so you'll get every bit of it. But today, don't worry about the details of the model or the mathematics. Just try to view the, the entire process of modeling as I describe it and get an overall idea of what that model is and what it's for and what it does. And then we'll go back over it again. The pictures I am about to show you are in uh, the handout, the one that's labeled Quick overview of a simple system dynamics study. Part one, the Kaibab Plateau model. And so you don't need to take details on the uh, pictures, uh, take detailed notes on the pictures I'm going to show you. You've got them already. Figure 2 1, which is the first figure in that series, just lists the steps that we as modelers follow in putting a model together for the first time. Uh, you won't really need to follow these steps as a whole in this course, because this is not a course in making models. But I wanted you to see what the procedure is so you know where these models come from. And several of these steps you will, in fact, be doing uh, in, in the course. The first thing we start with is a problem or a system that we want to know something about. And the first thing we try to do is just describe in words what we know about that system. And uh, the system we're going to talk about today is described in words in figure 2-2. Two, two. And I think we should take about two minutes and let each of you read that right now.
this is obviously an ecological system and an ecological problem. It was in fact by the, the great early ecologist Aldo Leopold, and this is a description from a standard ecology textbook. It's a classic case of an ecological system that has gone out of control. And uh, the question we're going to be asking is how to manage such a system. Uh, I should perhaps fill in a little bit of information about the Kaibab Plateau. It's in the Grand Canyon area, and as I understand it, it's a really steep plateau, so the deer that live on the plateau stay there. There's no migration in or out. Uh, the figures given here, this is a, an actual historical account of what has happened, and since that time, the Kaibab Plateau has been roughly a desert with very low deer population. It never recovered from this experience. Okay. Step two is to define as precisely as possible what it is about this system that we're going to try to represent in the model. And we do that in two steps, as system dynamicists at least, we do that in two steps. We make what is called a reference mode, and that is simply a, a picture over time of what that system has done or what we expect it might do, because what we want with our model is to duplicate the time behavior of the system. And just to show you exactly what I mean by reference mode, here's the one which we didn't even have to draw. Aldo Leopold drew this one for us. A description of what actually happened to the deer population on the Kaibab Plateau. This is time plotted on this axis and number of deer plotted on the vertical axis starting in 1905 and going to 1940. And you can see the gro rapid growth of the deer. There also is down below some uh, figures on the kill of coyotes and, and wolves and the other deer predators. The deer grew faster and faster. There was a, a hesitation point over a few years and then the deer population dropped precipitously and leveled off at a, at a point low, relatively low population of about 10,000 deer. Now that, in this case, that's the actual historical behavior of the system. And we call it a reference mode because the first test of our computer model is going to be whether it can duplicate that problem. It's not going to tell us very much about the, the world if it can't at least replicate the problem. And then what we'll do with the, comp with the model, once we've got it to that point, is try to change it so that the problem doesn't show up. All right, that's a reference mode. Uh, the second part of defining the problem is to specify the time horizon. And that means the period of time over which we're going to be interested in the system. And in this case, it's the period of time that is required to duplicate the reference mode. It, it looks from this drawing uh, like 30 to 40 years uh, is going to be the amount of time we'll have to follow that system in order to understand and duplicate that behavior. And so that as a rough start, we would set to 30 to 40 years as the time horizon of the model. And that tells us quite a lot. It tells us, for example, that something that happens over a period of seconds probably won't be in the model. It, something that happens over 10,000 years probably won't be in the model. But something that happens with a time period of, say, a couple of years up through 50 to 100 years might be something of interest that we should include in the model. And so that definition of time horizon already tells us quite a lot about how to go on and make the model. Okay. The next step, which is easy to live, very difficult to do, is to start to make what we call a causal loop diagram of the model that we're going to make. And uh, there's no set or easy way to do this because this is where the real thinking begins. Uh, what I usually do just to start is put right in the middle of a blank piece of paper some element of the system that I know I'm going to need to put in the model, like, for example, in this case, the deer population. Whatever else I'm going to do with this model, I'm pretty sure I need the deer population in it because, in fact, that's what my reference mode is all about. Okay? All right, now I've got that down. That's a wonderful first step. Now, what causes the deer population to change over time? Because that's <laughs> my question deals with the changing of the deer population over the time. Well, there, since I've ruled out migration by the uh, 
the, the way the plateau is formed, there's really only two things that can cause the deer population to change. One is births of deer, and one is deaths of deer. It's absolutely the only two things that can directly make a deer population change, okay? Unless we helicopter them in it's, or something of that sort, which I'm going to rule out for the purposes of this model. The arrow in this diagram means that as this element changes, I expect this element to change as a result. And I'll put a little plus or minus sign next to the arrow to indicate how the direction I expect the change to be. The plus sign means that as births of deer increase, the number of deer increase. The two elements are going in the same direction, so therefore there's a plus sign. On this arrow, I'll put a minus sign, meaning as the deaths of deer increase, the deer population will decrease. In this case, the two elements are moving in opposition to each other, and a minus sign goes on the arrow. Now, that's the, that's the formalism we use to begin to sketch how it is that things are connected in the system that we're trying to understand. And uh, figure 2-4 will show you a completed causal diagram of a very first rough model of the Kaibab deer system. And here's the deer population as I had it before. Uh, in this case, births and deaths have been collapsed into what I call a net increase. Yeah, did you have a question? That's right. It, the arrow in this case indicates uh, causation, in which case I'm saying that the, th the thing at the head of the arrow causes or changes the thing at the end of the arrow. And in, if those of you who've had uh, other forms of modeling would call this the dependent variable, the thing at the end of the area, ar arrow, and uh, the causal factor is the independent variable. Now you'll find that this breaks down a little bit, the distinction between dependent and independent, because in this case, for example, I have a closed set of arrows, and that I'm going to call a feedback loop, a, a phrase you will hear very often in this class. Uh, a feedback loop is a closed chain of causation. In this case, uh, the net increase, which we'll define as the difference between the birth rate and the death rate, births minus deaths. As that goes up, the deer population goes up, therefore there's a plus on that arrow. As the deer population goes up, the number of deer that can be born every year goes up. The net increase is defined as the number of deer born minus the number of deer that die per year. The more deer there are, the more deer will be born, and therefore this arrow goes the other direction and says more deer, more births, and there's also a plus. That makes what I call a positive feedback loop. The plus sign with the parentheses in the middle of the diagram indicates the whole loop is positive. I'll, tell, I'll talk a lot more about positive and negative feedback loops on Wednesday. I just want you to see that that's, that's how they are shown on the diagrams. Now let me tell you what the rest of the, this little model is. The net increase rate is defined as the number of deer born or dying per deer in the population per year. It's, what, it's, it's the equivalent of what we would call a birth rate in a normal demographic uh, language. So this is, a, this is a rate per year. This rate times the number of deer tells you the actual number of deer born or dying in deer per year is a constant. I've assumed that there's a constant birth rate. The deer birth rate does not vary, nor does the death rate. Now, I have, however, influenced the deer population by another kind of influence. What I've really done is distinguish deaths into two parts. One is deaths by natural causes, uh, old age, and one is deaths by predators. And the predation rate in deer per year, I'm I I've represented separately in this model. The more predation, the fewer the deer. Therefore, this arrow is negative. Uh, the deer density, well, let, let me go backwards and, and define now what causes uh, predation what, to change. I've defined predation as a function of the number of predators around and the number of deer each predator kill. Now, that makes 
sense, right? That's sort of mathematically obvious. The number, total number of deer killed is the number of predators times the number of deer each predator kills. Now, how many deer does each predator kill? I've said that that's a function of the density of the deer. If there are deer just all over the place, it's really easy for a wolf to find one, right? Okay. So he'll kill more. If the deer are really hard to find and they're all, they've occupied all the good hiding places and so on, it gets really tough for the poor wolves and they kill a lot fewer per deer. And therefore the deer density influences the number of deer killed per predator. And the density is simply a function of how many deer there are divided by the area of the Kaibab Plateau, which I've assumed is a constant. It doesn't change. You can tell, by the way, looking at this, that it's a constant because there are no arrows going into area. There's, the area affects things in the system, but things in the system don't affect the area of the plateau. And here are another two sets of words that I will use very often. Area is an exogenous variable in this model. Exogenous. <laughs> that means it influences the, the system I'm talking about, but it is not influenced by the system. The deer population, on the other hand, is an endogenous variable. That means it is influenced by things happening in the system. It also influences things in the system, endogenous. It's involved in the middle of a feedback loop. Those are classic words. We will use those all the way through the course. OK. Uh, those are the entire set of elements I'm going to put in my first rough deer model. This is how I'm going to explain. I know there's something having to do with predators that causes this eruption of the deer herd. Therefore, I've got the predators in there. I'm going to make it harder for predators to kill the deer when there are fewer deer around. And this is going to be my postulation of how the things in that system fit together. Now, the next step in modeling is to take that causal diagram. That's a very rough sketch. You notice I haven't put any numbers in yet. I haven't said anything about how many deer a uh, baby deer, an adult deer can have, or how many deer a wolf can eat. Nothing of that is in there yet. I'm only uh, connecting things so far. Now I'm going to have to start getting very specific. Uh, and so I go through the next two steps, which is the formation of a dynamo flow diagram and specification of dynamo equations. Dynamo is a computer language. It's not the only one, and it's not the only one we'll use in this course, but it's the first one we'll use in the course, and uh, you'll get a deep introduction to Dynamo on Friday. For the moment, just let me illustrate what a Dynamo flow diagram looks like. I think you can see the direct translation from this rough causal diagram to a Dynamo flow diagram. The box means the deer population is a level. It's changed by a flow of deer into it from the deer net increase rate, and it's, there's a flow out through predation. Uh, the cloud is where deers go when they've been eaten by wolves. And the, the other cloud is where deers come from in the first place. That means those are beyond the concern of this model. Uh, the, the solid arrows indicate a real flow of deer, a physical flow of something. And that anything in that flow has to be conserved. It can't suddenly disappear without my having accounted for it some way. The dashed arrows mean an information flow. It's a piece of information I need to calculate the model. Uh, and information can be in more than two, two places at the same time and so on. It doesn't need to be conserved. Uh, everything in this causal diagram is in the dynamo flow diagram. It's a little more specific. For example, the constants are shown clearly as constants going into the model. All the variables are either circles or boxes or milk cans, uh, which we call rates. Somebody likes to call these uh, spaghetti and meatball diagrams. Uh, the predator population, I notice I've also made exogenous. Nothing influences it. But I'm going to vary it, and therefore I've put it in a circle instead of making it a regular uh, constant, such as the area. OK. The double circle means that it's exogenous. All right. The next step, which is quite easy once we've come this far, is to translate that into a language a computer can understand. And figure 2.6 shows what the computer program looks like for this model. You don't need to understand all of this today. Let me uh, just point out it's, it's very much less complicated than it looks like. First of all, 
the equations from 50 down through 160 are the only ones that really express the model. All the assumptions of the model are there. And all the rest of the equations are just me talking to the computer or the computer talking to me. It has nothing to do with what I've said about the DEER system. It only has to do with how to get the, com the model to run. And so the essence of the model goes from equation 50 to equation 160. And just to show you how really simple it is, I'll tell you what a few of these equations mean. Uh, 50, the equation 50 is a level equation for the DEER population DP. What it says is that DEER population at time K, which is now, is what the deer population was a minute ago at time j, plus the amount of time that's elapsed between the minute ago and now, times the number of deer that have been born, minus the number of deer that have been eaten. That's all it says. Pretty simple. Uh, the next two equations say start with 4,000 deer. Uh, the next one tells me the deer net increase rate is a function of the number of deer I've got times that net increase rate constant. That's all. The area equation, which is 140, just says the area equals 800,000, uh, I don't remember whether it's, I guess it's acres, 800,000 acres, and so on. Uh, the one thing you should know is that there's one tricky nonlinear equation uh, in this group. This is the assumption I've made about how the deer kill rate is related to the deer density. Remember that assumption? It's kind of a tricky one. The deer density is plotted here on this axis, and the number of deer killed per predator per year is plotted on the vertical axis. What this assumption says is if there are no deer kill, that's that point, okay? If there are a whole lot of deer, the wolves get so fat and full that they just can't catch anymore, even if more deer get put down. So at some point, the, deer, the wolves get saturated with deer. That's way out here on this end of the axis. And they won't kill more than um, six, 56 deer per year per wolf, no matter how many deer there are. That's the most a wolf can eat. Uh, and in between, the relationship goes something like this. As more deer get put onto the plateau, this is the rate at which the wolves will kill them, okay? Do you understand how that assumption goes? Now, the assumption, if you want to know, is put into the computer in the two equations, 110 and 120, and I'll explain how that's done next time. But for the moment, I want you to see what the assumption looks like that I've made there, because it's a pretty dubious assumption. Okay. Now that's ready to run. The computer can understand it. Uh, and the next step is analysis of the model, which means putting it on the computer and fooling around with it. And just to show you what that model looks like when it's run on the computer, remember I said that the predators were going to be exogenous. I was going to set that number outside of the model and change it as I like. Well, I started by, set, by putting in 300 predators and just keeping 300 wolves and keeping it at 300 to see what would happen. The result is shown in figure 2.7. This is the way the Dynamo compiler generates an output. It plots time across the horizontal axis starting in 1880 and going to 1970. I told it to do that. Uh, it plots different, whatever I ask for on the vertical axis. In this case, it's plotting three things. Uh, deer with a, a sign D, predators with a P, and K, which is the deer kill rate. And those are the th I asked it to plot those three things. And uh, this is the way that the system behavior emerges from those assumptions I made. The predator population is constant at 300. That's no surprise. I said it that way. The deer population starts at 4,000 and it goes gradually down to almost nothing. Well, that was surprising to me. So I thought I've probably got too many predators around. So I set the predator uh, population down to 100. And you can see in the second plot, the predator population is down lower. And in this case, the deer population rises from 4,000 up to almost, it looks like about uh, 9,000 deer. And then it, then it levels off. Well, that's very interesting. So I said to myself, somewhere between 100 and 300, there must be exactly an equilibrium number of predators that will hold the deer at 4,000. Now, a little exercise you can try to see how smart, smart you are is to see if you can figure out in advance what that number is. 
I'm real smart, so I figured it out. I knew immediately it was 266. Uh, you can actually figure that out from the equations. See if you can do it by next time. Uh, you put in 266 predators and hold it there, and the system is in perfect equilibrium. You have 4,000 deer. The deer, of course, are being born and they're getting eaten, but the rate at which they're born and eaten is just enough uh, to hold the population at 4,000 deer. Now, I try the grand experiment and do what happened in the real plateau, slowly take the predators away. This is a simulation of the bounty policy, essentially. When I do that, this is shown in figure 2A at the bottom. The predator population, I start at my equilibrium value of 266 and slowly bring it down until it becomes zero by 1960. And what the deer population does in this case is it stays steady for a long time, then it gradually begins to grow, and it grows and it grows and it grows, and in fact, it grows right off up to infinity if I let it run long enough. It keeps on growing. Well, that is not the reference mode of the model, if you recall. In fact, it's not a very plausible behavior at all. And that's one of the main points I should make about modeling, is you never go through that series of steps once. You usually have to recycle through it again and again because you've made some stupid assumption. Now, what was the stupid assumption in that model? Don't look, don't look on to the next model. Yeah? Infinite food supply. In fact, no food supply. I didn't say anything about food. Food wasn't even in that model, was it? Look back at the causal diagram. I haven't got the Kaibab Plateau in there. I've only got the deer and the wolves. Okay, let's put in some food and see what happens. Another nice thing about models is that they're easily variable. And if you make a mistake, you can try again without much cost. So now let's make a new model. We'll call it Deer Model 2. This is shown in Figure 2.9. The heavy arrow on the causal diagram, heavy arrows, show what I have added from the previous model. I've kept everything in the previous model. The predators are still there. The density function is still there. The net increase is still there. But now I've added some food. And you'll see that is out here in, in let's say, the edible kilocalories of biomass on the plateau. And the food uh, and the deer together can tell me how much food there is for each deer. That's food per deer. And now I have the food per deer influencing the net increase rate. So that if there's a lot of food, the deer will, will uh, flourish and multiply. But if food gets scarce, they're going to stop multiplying. They may even starve. OK, so I've added another feedback loop, a negative feedback loop. And uh, you can see here how I've put this into the model. I've got a new constant called food. I've got food per deer as a variable that I calculate. Food per deer influences the net increase rate through this sequence of information here. And then the net increase rate might shut off that inflow of deer. Just to show on figure 210 what the new equations look like. All the other equations are there. The underlined equations are the new ones. You can see I've made some food. This is in equation 120. 8E6 means 8 times 10 to the 6th kilocalories. So that's 10 million kilocalories. That's just a short way of writing it. Uh, food per deer is in equation 110. FPD is equal to food divided by deer population. Pretty simple. And so on. Uh, the assumption I've made in that critical link now between food per deer and net increase rate is shown uh, at, uh, in this graph at the bottom of figure 210. Food per deer is on the horizontal axis, and the net increase rate is on the vertical axis. And I've assumed, let's, let's take a lot of food first. Over here, where there's just gobs of food around per deer, uh, there's an upper limit to the rate at which the deer can multiply. And I've assumed that's 0.2, which means 20% per year. The deer population can increase by 20% per year if there's plenty of food around. So that's a, essentially a biological statement about the reproductive capability of the deer. As food becomes scarce, as you go down the axis this way, the uh, reproductive capability be gradually begins to, to decrease. And finally, at 1,000 kilocalories per deer per day, that's the units in which this food per deer is measured, 
the reproduction becomes zero. That means that the, birth, the death rate is essentially rising. The birth rate might also be falling a little bit. But at 1,000, the, uh, the total net increase rate becomes zero. Births and deaths, natural deaths, uh, just balance. And if food gets even less than that, less than 1,000 kilocalories per deer per day, then the net increase rate actually becomes negative, which means that deaths are higher than births. And it gets more and more and more negative as there gets to be less and less food. And the final assumption is at zero food, 50% of the deer herd dies off per year. Now, you might say that's very unrealistic, and you can make it 100% of the deer herd, and uh, I'll show you how to do that in a minute. But at the moment, uh, the assumption is that the fastest die-off rate is 50% of the herd per year. OK, is that clear? All right, what does that do? Don't look. <laughs> what do you think that's going to do to the behavior of the deer system? Now that I've added this assumption about food. Yeah. Okay, so we have one suggestion that the deer herd is going to do something like that, a sigmoid curve. Yeah, you have another idea? Does it start? Does it start out dropping? No, no. Once, once it reaches that the big increase, will reach a point where it just drops. Okay, so you think it's going to increase for a while, and then it's going to do something like that. Any other ideas? Yeah. So you think it'll go up and then come down like that, sort of, and then level off? The food is constant. It keeps coming back so that it's at 8 million kilocalories, standing mass. Are you criticizing my model already? <laughs> OK. Let's talk for a minute about this model and how it's going to behave. We'll fix it up in a minute. OK, here, here's the computer run. The nice thing about computers, you see, is that it resolves these arguments, if you've done them right. Figure 211 shows how that deer model 2 behaves. Foley got it right. Uh, the deer population now in this model Starts at 4,000 again, and I start with 266 predators again, that equilibrium number of predators. And the population, uh, as the predator co population comes down, the deer population slowly begins to grow, and it eventually levels off at, it looks like about 8,000 deer, and just stops there. Now, again, if, if you want to try an extra credit <coughs> assignment to see how well you understand that, you can figure out why it stopped there. Uh, what I, what's more concerned to me is why didn't it show that overshoot and then collapse that the real herd on the real Kaibab Plateau did? What's wrong? Food what? What about food? Okay, what should I do to it? Vary it with the deer population. OK, one thing we know is that deer eat food, right? So I ought to at least have that in the model <laughs> as, a, as a start. Uh, you've got to watch modelers. They make these stupid assumptions all the time. And you've got to, the worst assumptions, the hardest ones to catch, are the ones that got left out. Uh, let's try again. This is deer model three. Figure 212. OK, now I've added a whole lot of stuff about food. Again, this is going to be a simplified set of assumptions. Uh, I always try to make the model as simple as I can and complicated as I go, rather than starting with the most complicated model I can make and then simplifying it, because I understand it better if I go if I go this direction. Now, all of this part up on top of the figure is the same as it was before. I've just taken that constant food and added a lot of things that will change the amount of food. Food is now, you see, a variable. It's now endogenous. There are a lot of arrows going into it. And in particular, I have, well, two arrows going into it. One is a food regeneration rate, the rate at which the food grows, the, the, the grass and the bushes grow. 
And the other is the food consumption rate. That's the rate at which the deer are eating it. So those are the two arrows coming in that are going to change the amount of biomass standing on the plateau. Now, what causes those two rates to change? This gets complicated. The food consumption rate must be a function of the deer population, right? So this, this arrow coming down from the deer population, as the deer population goes up, the food consumption rate goes up. There's a positive arrow. Uh, it's also, uh, the food consumption rate is also influenced by the amount of food each deer will eat in a day, which is a constant that I've put in over here. Except if there's no food around, then, it, then the deer won't eat that much. But as long as the food's there, this is how much a deer can eat. And I've assumed that that's constant. Uh, as the amount of food goes down, it influences the food per deer just as before. And then the food per deer influences the net increase rate of the deer with the same assumption as before. Now, the regeneration time. Uh, here I've been rather tricky, and I've tried in a simple way to put in some things that I know about uh, how a biomass really grows. What I've assumed is that there's a regeneration rate, that is the, essentially the time it would take, uh, the inverse of the time it would take the plateau to restore itself after being eaten down to a certain amount. Uh, as the rate goes up, the amount of food goes up. The rate is influenced itself by the amount of food that's there and this is a negative arrow, and what that means is that the more food there is, the lower the rate is, or the other way around, the less food there is, the higher the regeneration rate. Now that assumption, in that assumption, I'm trying to get across the idea that there's a, a certain carrying capacity for the green stuff on the plateau as well. And if you take some away, there'll be more sunshine or more water or soil nutrient for what's left. And as it gets up to whatever the saturation point on the plateau is, there'll be a natural leveling off of the regeneration rate. So that at the maximum, the regeneration rate will be just zero. The minute it gets a little below maximum, there'll be room for something to grow. So it'll grow. And as it gets more and more down, it'll be easier and easier for something new to come in and grow. That's what this little arrow stands for. That's one assumption. Now let me finish it by putting in this loop here which does the opposite of what I just told you. What this loop, what I'm trying to get across in this loop is that at some point, however, you, you can get the biomass eaten down so far that in fact the regenerative capacity gets weakened. That is, the deer not only eat the grass, but they go down below and scrape up the roots and eat them. Or they eat all of the seeds that might have dropped down to generate more biomass. Uh, in that case, the, more, the, the less food there is, the slower the regeneration rate. And there's some threshold. That is, above the threshold, this loop is operating. And the more grass gets eaten, the faster it grows back up. But beyond some threshold, this loop takes over. And the time, the natural time it would take to regenerate, gets longer and longer, which means the rate gets lower and lower. And once that process starts, that makes um, a positive feedback loop coming around here. The less food there is, the longer the regeneration time, the slower the regeneration rate, the less food there is in the future, and so on. And so after this threshold is passed where that loop gets turned on, it gets harder and harder to regenerate the plateau. Before it, it gets easier and easier. That's a complicated set of ideas expressed in a very few arrows. Mm -hmm. And it's a little hard to keep it all in your mind at once. And that's why, uh, at this point, we, we try to put it on the computer to see what it all means if you put it all together. Because there are two opposing tendencies now in the biomass part of the system. OK. Uh, figure 213 shows what the causal or the dynamo flow diagram for this system looks like. And now it's getting to be somewhat complicated. The deer population is up here as before. Uh, it's a level and there are deer flowing in and deer flowing out. There's another new level now, which is the food supply. And there's a regeneration. This is grass flowing in and grass flowing out. Uh, that is grass eaten by deer. And uh, the rates of those flows are 
shown by these milk can symbols, the rate symbols, we call them. The upper part of the diagram is just as it was before. The predator population is still exogenous. Uh, this is the deer density and the deer kill loop. Here's the food and the net increase loop, and the food influences food per deer. The deer population influences the rate at which food is consumed. Uh, this constant is the amount that each deer can eat per day. And the food regeneration rate here is now influenced directly by the food supply. That is, the lower the food supply, the faster the rate. And is indirectly through this table, or this, excuse me, this nonlinear relationship, influenced so that the lower the food supply, the slower the regeneration rate. The equations are shown in figure 214. Equations 290 through 370 have added all that stuff I just told you about food. You can see there's a new food level. That's equation 290. Food at time k at now is equal to food a little while ago, plus the time interval times the rate at which food has regenerated over that interval, that's FRR, minus the rate at which the food has been consumed over that interval, and that's FCR. And we start with, uh, I gave it a lot more food this time, 470 million kilocalories of food. That's equation 310. I've uh, had to put in another one of these relationships to, to express that idea of uh, the threshold and the slower regeneration time if the range gets eaten down below a certain point. That's shown in the diagram at the bottom of the page. On the horizontal axis here is the food that's on the plateau divided by the maximum amount of food so that it, this number equals one when the plateau has got as much growing on it as it possibly can hold and it gets less than one as it gets eaten down below that level. That's what's plotted here. So one is the most amount of food that could be grown given the soil and the climate and everything else on the plateau. And uh, the vertical axis expresses the amount, the, the number of years it takes to regenerate the food supply completely from zero up to uh, full uh, biomass. And the assumption here is that if there's a full biomass, if there's a lot of food around, it takes a very short time to regenerate. As the food gets eaten down, it takes longer and longer and longer and longer. I suppose at zero food, it almost should be infinite because it, wait, it has to wait for some bird to fly in over the plateau and drop a seed or something because there's no biomass left to generate more biomass. But in fact, the maximum amount of time I've given is 35 years. That is, uh, I, that's some assumption about the rate at which birds fly in and drop seeds, I guess. <laughs> okay. Uh, but in general, what happens now in the model is, is if, if the plateau gets eaten down past a certain point, it takes longer and longer and longer to regenerate. Okay. Now, I imagine the suspense is killing you, so we'll go on to figure two. 15. Ta-da! Uh, all of those assumptions I have just told you about are now grinding away in the computer. It starts out with 4,000 deer and 266 predators, as it has in all of the other runs that I've shown you. Uh, I've now also added to the plot the food supply. This is the total amount of food on the plateau. I now want to keep track of that, and that's plotted with an S in the upper part of the upper left-hand corner of the diagram. Uh, the time is going from 1880 to 1960, and uh, you can see I've brought the predator population, the P's on the map, on the graph, down to zero slowly over a 20-year period, as before. Uh, the deer population stays low at 4,000, and then it slowly grows and grows. And in about 1927 or 1930, it hits a peak. The peak happens to be at just about exactly the, the actual peak on the Kaibab Plateau by some strange, fortuitous circumstances. Uh, and then the deer population collapses. And you can see why it collapses, because you can follow what happens to the food supply, which is the S on the graph. And that comes plummeting down, and at the end of the uh, at the end of the eruption, when the deer population has come back down, you can see that the food supply is down very low and is not regenerating. 
In other words, uh, the Kaibab Plateau in this run has, has been turned into a desert. And the population at the end of the, the deer population at the end of the run is about, looks like it's about 20,000. That's higher than the original 4,000, but it's not as high as the population that could at one time have been supported on the plateau with, with this very high amount of the original biomass. Now, let's go back a minute to the steps of modeling. I have come now as far as 6A. That is, I've now got a model that at least generates the reference mode that I was originally interested in duplicating. That, of course, is, is almost the beginning of the process. It's not the end. I haven't proved anything. Just because it does that doesn't mean that anything in there is right. Uh, it just means that I'm, I might be on the right track. At least I'm more on the right track than I was in my first two models. Okay, that's about all we know at this point. And then come a whole lot of different uh, kinds of tests that are done both in the computer and presumably out in the real world looking at real deer uh, in order, for example, to see whether my numbers about uh, net increase rate are correct or not. So th at this point, you've, you've just gotten to a breathing space, but you have by no means finished the process of modeling. And what I will ask you to do as your first homework assignment is to carry on uh, the next two steps, which is to take this model and run it, and try different assumptions, and try different policies to see under what conditions it behaves differently and under what conditions uh, we can avoid that eruption and desert, desertification outcome altogether. Uh, I will, on Wednesday and on Friday, Go back through all the details of the model so that you understand each equation and what it does so that then you can start changing it. Uh, the purpose of a model is to be changed and tested and poked and pushed uh, until you've come to either the conclusion that it's a stupid model and you've got to start again or the conclusion that you've learned something about the real system. And the final step, seven, occurs at that point where you've gone through probably 20 reiterations of a model till you've got it to the point where you think it's teaching you something about the system. And then comes the question of how you summarize what you've learned, communicate it to other people, or implement the policies that seem to have, uh, have come out of the model. And uh, you'll get a chance to do all of that later. Okay, any questions? Any questions about course procedure? Yeah. Okay, done. Uh, I see F appears about 1940. Yeah.